It's going live. All right, so we're live. So everyone, welcome to the second episode of Washington Unmasked with me. I'm Julie Borowski. Today on our show, we have Matt Kidd, President and CEO of FreedomWorks. Now he's with Concerned American Voters. He's written several books, the most recent being Don't Hurt People and Don't Take Their Stuff. Thank you for being on here with us, Matt. Hey, Julie. How's it going? Good. How are you? I'm awesome. <laughs> so um, could you give us an update on what you've been up to, your decision to leave FreedomWorks and join Concerned American Voters? Yeah, I think it's been a couple months now, but uh, I decided that we had a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to elect a real liberty-loving candidate to the presidency of the United States. And I, you know, I, I created FreedomWorks in 2004. It was my baby, and we did some really awesome things there. But I felt like this was a choice that I couldn't not make. It, I felt like that, that if I didn't step up and at least try to fill the presidency with someone that actually respects the Constitution, I would hate myself for a long time. And it's just as hard as I imagined it would be. I, I think we've been in this process for about five years of trying to repopulate Washington, D.C., trying to repopulate the Republican Party with people that believe in liberty, people that believe in constitutional restraints on the presidency, and I think Rand stands sort of head and shoulders above the entire Republican field in his understanding of the entire Bill of Rights, as he would like to say. And I think he has the establishment freaking out a little bit, and I think those are some of the bumps in the road he's facing right now. So, as I'm sure you know, uh, some, in the some in the liberty movement have mixed feelings towards Rand Paul. You hear Rand Paul isn't libertarian enough, Rand Paul is not his father, all those kinds of things. Why should libertarians support Rand Paul? You know, I've never heard those those criticisms. <laughs> no, you know, I think um, the the difference between Ron Paul and Rand Paul is that they're trying to accomplish very different goals. Ron Paul was trying to get the American people to appreciate what was going on in the United States, to understand what liberty actually means, and to understand the values of free markets and the power of free people coming together and doing things, uh, Rand is trying to win the presidency. These are two different things, and, and the fact of the matter is that, that is, as powerful as I think libertarian ideals are, and as compelling as they can be, particularly to young independent voters that probably haven't heard these ideas before, he's got to build a coalition, and he's got to build a winning coalition of Republicans, all of whom are either new to these ideas, or maybe even a little bit uncomfortable with some of his views on foreign policy, say, yeah. some of his views on, on drug policy. So it's, it's a different project, and the key to being a libertarian is that, that you're not, you're not going to agree with everybody and everything, and there's only one perfect libertarian, and that's yourself. And the rest <laughs> of us are, are, are suspects sometimes. Yeah, on the other hand, you have a bunch of Republicans who say Rand Paul is an isolationist, he's too much like his father in foreign policy. How do you get the, the rest of the GOP on base with libertarian ideas? I think it's about communications, first of all, and this is something that I think Rand is very good at. He's, he's got an affable style. You know, some people will complain that Rand's not aggressive enough. Well, that's his style. And I think when you're talking about sometimes radical ideas, it's, it's better not to be scary, it's better not to be shouting. I think if you look at how he performed in the last debate and you compare him to someone like, like Chris Christie, that's where we connect with voters that wouldn't otherwise participate in a Republican primary. But it's, it's an education process. I think ultimately the ideas of liberty come from the bottom up. And, and starting with the presidency is never a good idea, but here we are, the fight is now, and, and you either join this fight as is, imperfect as it is, or you sit on the sidelines and potentially see someone like Donald Trump or Chris Christie win the Republican nomination. And I hope we all agree that that's a disaster. Yeah, I was going to ask, I've seen a lot of Tea Party people, even people who are friendly with Freedom Works, support Donald Trump. Why are these Tea Partiers supporting Donald Trump? 
how do you convince them that Rand Paul is the better candidate? You know, I try to be understanding, and everyone's talking now about how between Donald Trump and Ben Carson and Carly Fiorina, over 50% of Republican primary voters are going with somebody that's a total outsider, meaning that they've never held public mm -hmm. office. Um, ironically, the, the only difference between Carly Fiorina and Rand Paul is that he won his race in 2010. She didn't. Um, and the, the fact of the matter is being a, a Republican senator in this environment, and I would argue it's a fairly rational reaction that voters have, that, that they don't trust anybody in DC. But Rand, I think, is going to sort of survive the beauty contest process that we're going through now, and he will be the authentic alternative to the establishment of Republican as the field narrows. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure as you're well aware, Rand Paul hasn't been doing that well in the polls lately, why do you think that is? What what advice would you give him? Well, two things. First of all, that that fifty plus percent that's that's being consumed by the three outsiders right now is certainly part of the answer. And the fact that there's so many candidates. Last last I counted, there was about a thousand Republican candidates running for president, mm -hmm. and that that sort of uh, drives down any particular candidate's numbers. But the other thing I would say, and I agree with uh, libertarian critics of some of Rand's early performance, he needs to differentiate himself. And the best way to do that is for him to be himself. Don't worry about what the consultants are telling you to say. Don't, don't worry about what Chris Christie supporters are gonna think of you. Speak the truth, speak it well. And I think we saw that in the last debate and he, he differentiated himself and my advice now is stay the course, stick with that strategy. Yeah, I agree. I made some constructive criticism of Rand Paul before where it's kind of like he's trying to play both teams. He's trying to keep the libertarians happy and expand to more, to more conservative people, but sometimes his message is completely different to both teams, so it looks doesn't look as genuine, I guess. Um, also, he's kind of been attacking Donald Trump a lot, and a lot of people have said that strategy isn't working, so it'd be great if he was, he did much better at the last debate if he would just, you know, stick the course and tell voters how he's different from the rest of the candidates. But I was wondering if you could tell me more about um, concerned American voters, what are you guys doing, what is your strategy? Yeah, so, so we started a, a group called Concerned American Voters, which is one of the super PACs that, that Rand Paul has endorsed um, as supporting his cause. And unlike um, other super PACs across the Republican field, our job is first and foremost to organize citizens on the ground, particularly in battleground caucus states like Iowa. We're, we're going to be moving into Nevada and other caucus states. And the reason for that is that the Liberty Movement is different. The Liberty Movement is connected and Rand Paul inherits a, a constituency, a machinery, um, not just from his dad, but from the Tea Party movement, from the Liberty Movement, from the, the youth movement. These are, these are activists that have a particular passion that, that conducts itself well in a caucus where you literally have to spend the whole day in order to participate. In Iowa, it's a very small fraction of the public that, that mm -hmm. does that. And that's our job. That was uh, something that I focused on at FreedomWorks. Um, my business partner, if you will, the president of, of CAV is Jeff Frazee, who's also the president of Young Americans for Liberty. So you get a sense for where we're coming from. We're knocking on doors, we're making phone calls, we're doing voter idea. We're gonna organize the machinery that we know is gonna show up on caucus day and that's different than typical political consultants who run TV ads and you know take a slice of the buy. That's not how we're we're doing this. We're doing this because we believe in Rand, and then we're going to go back and find day jobs somewhere. <laughs> so, if there's a young Rand Paul supporter watching this and he wants or he or she wants to get involved, what would you tell them? So, one thing you can do is go to concernedamericanvoters.com and sign up and connect there. But if you're in a battleground state, you find the liberty movement, find a way to start knocking on doors. We can help you with those tools. But I think Rand thrives in, in, in a more organic model. This isn't going to be the campaign telling you what to do. 
Um, you know, they've they've talked about uh, organizing over 300 campuses um, within the Rand Paul campaign. We're going to test the proposition of whether or not young people will participate in politics. Where young people are not always that good at it. Mm -hmm. but this is the test, and you know that the, the so-called Ron Paul kids have now um, practiced the art of politics. They understand door knocking. They understand it's all about showing up. So we'll see how that works out. Great. I was wondering, what do you think about the future of the libertarian movement? Do you see it growing? Where do you think it's going to be in five years? So I, I think this is like the most exciting moment of my lifetime. I've been a libertarian since I was 13 years old. Julie, I won't tell you how old I am <laughs> because uh, I'm not sure you were born when I was reading my first uh, copy of Human Action. But the difference between then and now is the internet and the internet has created this this literal explosion this multiplier effect in the liberty movement because people can now get ideas outside of top-down systems your professor doesn't need to tell you the new york times doesn't need to tell you the republican party doesn't need to tell you you can find that for yourself that means that our institutions have to change that means that we need to probably scrap this this old Republican versus Democrat, right versus left paradigm that really doesn't explain what a libertarian is. We need to get into the popular culture. And I think, you know, gasp, we need to work with progressives who share our values on things like drug legalization, things like criminal justice, modest, humble foreign policy. Let's, let's do some of these shocking coalitions so that independents who don't know they're libertarians suddenly are, are listening, suddenly realize that, hey, I'm, I'm actually a, a libertarian. I'm, I'm not really that Bernie Sanders kid that I thought I was. Yeah, I see a lot of young people online uh, supporting Bernie Sanders. Uh, how do we reach out to the Bernie Sanders supporters? Well, I, you know, it's interesting. I think, I think young people are naturally drawn to values and ideas and, and really bold stances on things. And whatever else you might think about Bernie Sanders, in a lot of ways, he's probably the Ron Paul of this election cycle. He's not in a crowded primary field. Hillary clearly looks like a really bad choice and young people aren't excited about her. And, and you know, Bernie's talking about values. Unfortunately, they're the wrong values and he's, he's deeply confused about whether or not a big government can be benevolent, that's an opportunity for us. And I, there's a lot of rumors on the internet about potentially Rand Paul debating Bernie Sanders. I think that's a great idea. And I think that we can engage them and, and meet them in terms of values, but then discuss the practical implications of giving anybody, including the government, that much power. So I asked people for some questions, suggestions to ask you. And there was a lot of people asking, why should we vote for a Republican? Why not Gary Johnson? Why not the Libertarian Party? Aren't we Libertarians? Shouldn't we, you know, say screw you to the GOP and do our own thing? Well, I love Gary Johnson. And I think, I think he's an important uh, part of, of connecting, particularly with young people. But they're two different projects. If you want to simply educate young people about the values of liberty, Maybe Gary Johnson is the answer. Maybe he'll have a big enough stage. Um, you know, last time he didn't have nearly the stage that Ron Paul created running as a Republican. Mm -hmm. The Republican stage is bigger. And we're at this point now. We're mature enough. We're big enough. We're actually taken seriously, even by the New York Times. Maybe it's time to take over the Republican Party. Maybe we need to actually repopulate the party with, with people that share our values because ultimately, if you want to elect a president, you want to elect a senator, they're going to be either Republicans or Democrats, at least for now. So you have to sort of choose what your project is. I support both projects, but obviously I've decided that, that I want to put Rand Paul in the White House. Great. So we got some good news the other day about uh, Boehner um, resigning. Who would you pick for Speaker of the House? <laughs> well, you... You tweeted today, Ron Paul for speaker. I don't. Yeah. Think, I don't think Ron wants the job. Yeah. It is uh, constitutionally true that, that anybody can be elected speaker of the house. 
Um, I think the reality, whether or not um, we like it, is that we're not going to see radical change at the top. I mean, I'd like to see Justin Amash or Thomas Massey, who are my two favorite members of the House. But, but I think the answer to changing the direction of the House has to come from the top down, um, from the bottom up, not the top down. And uh, regardless of who the next speaker is, we have to continue to drive the grassroots pressure that ultimately replaced uh, John Boehner. I know at FreedomWorks, uh, we were doing a lot of stuff on criminal justice reform, which you were really excited about. Uh, could you tell the viewers more about criminal justice reform, maybe specific bills, what you actually want to do, and how to reach out to more people? Yeah, you know, one of the, one of the biggest teachable moments in the failure of big government is what we've done with the mass incarceration of, of so many millions of young people, primarily for nonviolent crimes like, like drug possession. And this was, a, this was a movement, it was a bipartisan stupid that was done primarily during the Clinton years, um, where we got really tough on drugs and, and we started passing all these so-called mandatory minimums. Well, today it's a nightmare. We have, we have mass incarceration, our prisons are overpopulated with young people who go in harmless, come out hardened criminals. Um, we also have a process, again, as part of the war on drugs, where we've given local law enforcement, in, in conjunction with, with federal law enforcement, the right to take your stuff, your property, before you've been even proven to commit a crime. It's called civil asset forfeiture. It's a way that, that uh, police and state law enforcement grows their coffers at the expense sometimes of small business people, sometimes of, of parents of, of young kids that have committed a, a dumb drug crime. It's just crazy stuff. And what's interesting about it is that we now have this, this rare right-left libertarian progressive agreement that big government got it wrong and that we can fix this. I think it's one of those rare instances where we have a common set of values. We're not, we're not splitting the difference on somebody else's bad idea. And I hope, I hope that the Congress acts on this this fall. Yeah, it's, it's really cool to see, you know, Obama working with the Kochs, working with Freedom Works, all these people coming together to support criminal justice reform, even conservatives. I know at Freedom Works, we kind of were struggling, how do we message this to conservatives? And especially in civil asset forfeiture, we had a lot of success with messaging to conservatives because it was a property rights issue. So that was really cool to see. I was hoping you could speak more about uh, how you became a libertarian and what books you read. And sure, you broke up at the end there, but I'll I'll go ahead and start talking. Um, are you back? Can you hear you? Yeah, am I am I here? There you are. Yeah, I was uh, um, I was a strange kid, and I, I discovered uh, the ideas of liberty literally reading reading the liner notes in a, in a Rush album called Twenty One Twelve. And uh, there's probably a few Rush fans watching this 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 session. Um, they dedicate that album to the genius of Ayn Rand. I didn't know who she was. I didn't even know that she was a she. But the name stuck in my head, and I found a used copy of Anthem at a garage sale a, a couple weeks after I had bought that album, and that just led me along a, a food chain of of books that I sought out. Um, going from Ayn Rand to her suggestion that I read Ludwig von Mises in order to understand economics. I was a strange enough kid that I actually read Human Action before I went to college. A horrible way, by the way, to meet girls. Um, but I just, I just got absorbed in it. And then I stumbled across Grove City College. I got to study under Hans Senholtz, who was a professor that studied under Ludwig von Mises. He's also the guy that turned Ron Paul onto monetary policy and his love for the gold standard. And it just took off after there. Um, the ideas are so important now because there are millions and millions of people that Googled that stuff that I stumbled across reading the liner notes on a rock album. That's awesome. 
Yeah, it's like as you said in your book, don't hurt people, don't take their stuff. It's such a simple concept that more people should get. And thankfully through the internet, we're seeing more people getting it. I know sometimes I struggle. I have a YouTube channel to reach more people just because I think people tend to look up things that they already agree with. That's what I've kind of noticed. How do you reach out to those other people? And I've, I've tried to do it in a way, you said pop culture, to do it kind of in a funny way, because not everyone is going to pick up human action and try to read it. I, I haven't actually read all of it, don't hurt me. But um, yeah, it's definitely a way to reach out to other people. So I have the chat room up here, and I'm just going to see if anyone has any other questions for you. I know I said I'd try to keep it around a half hour, because I know you're really busy. Let's see if anyone has any other questions. Oh, somebody asked if you're working on any other books. I am, in fact, uh, working on, on a new book. It's, it's still uh, sketched out, and I'm not going to give you the title yet because it's going to be that awesome that you're going <laughs> to hear about it. But I'm, I'm struggling with, and I'll... And this has to do with what you were just talking about. How do we take the ideas of liberty and translate them into memes that matter in popular culture? And I think I think we've made a lot of mistakes as libertarians using sort of tribal language and code words and secret handshakes. We talk about the non-aggression principle, when in fact our values are really embedded in everything that's, that's cool about being an American. And, and young people today live in what I call an a la carte society. They, they choose this and they choose that, choose that, and they stream their music and they, they, they pick piecemeal where they get their news in a way that, that I couldn't have dreamed of when I was a kid. Um, but we need to take, we need to, we need to ditch the 40 page white papers. We need to ditch uh, um, giving people copies of human action and start to do the kinds of things that you're doing with your videos. Let's, let's make it fun to be a libertarian. Let's make these values so common sense that they're they're part of the, the pop culture. And that's sort of the challenge. We need to sort of give up these institutional biases that we had, including everything that we accomplished at FreedomWorks. It was awesome, it was important, but what is the next step? How do we solve that problem and, and reach people that don't think they're libertarians today? And that's why I'm doing so many partnerships with progressives, that's why I would love to connect with with bands and artists and musicians, people that have thought that they're libertarians, but they're they're just a little uncomfortable with that whole Tea Party thing. Hmm. Um, somebody asked, do you recommend registering as a Republican for the primaries? I would. I mean, it depends on the state that you're in, mm -hmm. but but my philosophy has always been. If you're going to get involved in politics, choose one of the two teams. I decided a long time ago that the Democrats were hopeless. Sometimes I feel like the Republicans are hopeless too. But if we can, re if we can win, particularly in, in Republican primaries where no one's really paying attention, um, all of a sudden you have a Thomas Massey. All of a sudden you have a Justin Amash. Um, these, these are not anomalies anymore. We need to find more guys like that. Yeah, I would say check to see if your state's an open or a closed primary, because if it's a closed primary, you have to register as a Republican if you want to vote for a Republican candidate. Uh, somebody asked, oh, what's your favorite drink? What's my favorite drink? Yes. Tonight it's scotch, but sometimes I prefer beer, and I try to be open-minded and not, not be judgmental about people that prefer different drinks. <laughs> That's good. Okay. Looks like we're done with questions. Thank you so much for your time, Matt. I know you're extremely busy, so I, I definitely appreciate it. I just want to let everyone know that at 10 on this channel, on liberty.me, there's a Students for Liberty uh, video conference about incarceration rates in the United States, if you guys want to tune in at 10. Also, please sign up for liberty.me if you haven't already. The first month is free. And if you use my name, Julie, you get 20% off the next month. So please sign up if you haven't already. And I think that's it. Thank you again, Matt, for your time. Thanks, Julie. Keep signing off.
and constitutional restraints on the presidency. And I think Rand stands sort of head and shoulders above the entire Republican field in his understanding of the entire Bill of Rights, as he would like to say. And I think he has the establishment freaking out a little bit, and I think those are some of the bumps in the road he's facing right now. So, as I'm sure you know, uh, some, in the some in the liberty movement have mixed feelings towards Rand Paul. You hear Rand Paul isn't libertarian enough, Rand Paul is not his father, all those kinds of things. Why should libertarians support Rand Paul? You know, I've never heard those, those criticisms. <laughs> no, you know, I think um, the, the difference between Ron Paul and Rand Paul is that they're trying to accomplish very different goals. Ron Paul was trying to get the American people to appreciate what was going on in the United States, to understand what liberty actually means. And Yeah, on the other hand, you have a bunch of Republicans who say Rand Paul is an isolationist, he's too much like his father in foreign policy. How do you get the, the rest of the GOP on base with libertarian ideas? I think it's about communications, first of all, and this is something that I think Rand is very good at. He's, he's got an affable style. You know, some people will complain that Rand's not aggressive enough. Well, that's his style. And I think when you're talking about sometimes radical ideas, it's, it's better not to be scary. It's better not to be shouting. I think if you look at how he performed in the last debate and you compare him to someone like, like Chris Christie, that's where we connect with voters that wouldn't otherwise participate in a Republican primary. But it's, it's an education process. I think ultimately the ideas of liberty come from the bottom up. And, and starting with the presidency is never a good idea, but here we are, the fight is... Freedom Works and join Concerned American Voters? Yeah, I think it's been a couple months now, but uh, I decided that we had a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to elect a real liberty-loving candidate to the presidency of the United States. And, I, you know, I, I created Freedom Works in 2004. It was my baby, and we did some really awesome things there. But I felt like this was a choice that I couldn't not make. It, I felt like that, that if I didn't step up and at least try to fill the presidency with someone that actually respects the Constitution, I would hate myself for a long time. And it's just as hard as I imagined it would be. I, I think we've been in this process for about five years of trying to repopulate Washington, D.C., trying to repopulate the Republican Party with people that believe in liberty, people that believe in to understand the values of free markets and the power of free people coming together and doing things. Uh, Rand is trying to win the presidency. These are two different things. And, and the fact of the matter is that, that is, as powerful as I think libertarian ideals are and as compelling as they can be, particularly to young independent voters that probably haven't heard these ideas before, He's got to build a coalition, and he's got to build a winning coalition of Republicans, all of whom are either new to these ideas or maybe even a little bit uncomfortable with some of his views on foreign policy, say, yeah. some of his views on, on drug policy. So it's, it's a different project, and the key to being a libertarian is that, that you're not, you're not going to agree with everybody and everything, and there's only one perfect libertarian, and that's yourself. And the rest of us are, are, are suspects sometimes. It's going live. All right, so we're live. So everyone, welcome to the second episode of... Washington Unmasked with me. I'm Julie Borowski. Today on our show, we have Matt Kidd, President and CEO of Freedom Works. Now he's with Concerned American Voters. He's written several books, the most recent being Don't Hurt People and Don't Take Their Stuff. Thank you for being on here with us, Matt. Hey, Julie. How's it going? Good. How are you? I'm awesome. <laughs> so, um, could you give us an update on what you've been up to, your decision to leave 